Bulletproof Radio, a state of high performance. You're listening to Bulletproof Radio with Dave Asprey. Today's cool fact of the day is that over the hill cells may cause trouble in your brain as it ages. There's cells called senescent cells, which accumulate as you age, that are still alive, but are in a state of sort of suspended animation. They stop doing their jobs, and they stop dividing, and scientists have figured out that getting rid of those cells in your body extends the lifespan, at least it does in mice. It also improves heart and kidney health, and new research suggests that senescent cells make mischief in your brain as you get older. At the Mayo Clinic, molecular biologists studied mice with mutations that led nerve cells in their brains to build up levels of a toxin called, a a toxic protein called tau. And damaging globs of that protein called neurofibrillary tangles are a hallmark of Alzheimer's and lots of other bad things you probably read about in my book, Headstrong. But some of these mice, the researchers engineered a genetic trick, a kill switch to destroy cells as soon as they became senescent. And mutated mice with that switch did not accumulate that toxic protein as quickly, and those mice were able to better recognize new smells and objects than mice that had more of these suspended animation cells in their brains. And the troublemakers in mice are called glial cells, the support cells that help nerves in your brain do their jobs. What does this mean for us? This means that we are now engineering ways with natural compounds from plants, as well as lifestyle things, and probably some genetic things over time, that can help you get rid of that toxic protein or maybe even just get rid of senescent cells entirely. I'm taking some experimental things to get rid of my own senescent cells in my relentless quest to live to at least 180 years old. Mm -hmm. And I think you're going to find over the next five years that you have the ability to remove these uh, hangers on, these cells that aren't doing anything and hanging around, not getting out of the way. So, uh, Uh, The way I treat my mitochondria, the way I treat my cells is if you're not doing your job right, it's time to get out of here and be replaced by something that is, in fact, I kind of believe that about myself as well. (laughs) Today's guest is a very well-known author uh, and personal development uh, world leader. Her name is Byron Katie. You might have heard of her book called Loving What Is. Uh, She's an inspirational guide who offers people a different way to think their thoughts, uh, to change mindsets and their lives. And in 1986, at the bottom of a 10-year spiral into depression and rage, and as she describes it, self-loathing, when she was 43 years old, Byron woke up to a state of constant joy that never left her. And what she realized and what she teaches to this day is that when she believed her stressful thoughts, she suffered. And when she questioned them, she didn't suffer and that that is true for every human being. And she named her process of inquiry, The Work. And she's been bringing The Work to millions of people around the world for the last 30 years in public events, workshops, intensive retreats, and something called The Turnaround House. I wanted to have her on the show today because on my own path of being a biohacker, and after I I dealt with some of my biological things to lose 100 pounds, I realized I had to deal with some of the stuff going on in my head. And I learned early on that my powers of self-deception are legion. And uh, <laughs> I've, I've become aware of Byron's work. I've read her books and I've learned you don't believe the thoughts in your head. You always question them. And when you build that into your life, uh, you perform better as a human being in almost everything you do. And now we get to talk to the, the woman who created this, uh, which is a great pleasure. Byron, welcome to the show. Thank you, Dave. So good to be here. You are uh, down in in Ojai, and Mm -hmm. you're about to put on, uh, twice a year, you have an event, uh, a nine-day in-person event where you teach people the work. I think you have one in October and one in in, uh, February, was it? Uh, which is I think I think March. I'm oh, not March. sure, okay. but you know, it's, they can always find it on the work.com. Okay. But it's a nine day radical experience, and and yeah, it's, it's a good thing. If if you're at the state, and and there's millions of people here at Bulletproof Radio now, but if if you're at the state where you're saying I want to know what's going on with the thoughts in my head, uh, Byron's uh, body of work is powerful, and one of the things that launched me on my path of of personal development. Uh, was a 10-day workshop 
uh, many, many years ago uh, where I sat down and realized, well, there's all sorts of stuff I don't know. So there's great value to sitting down and spending uh, about a week with other people doing the same thing. Something happens differently than if you sit down by yourself for a week doing this, especially when you're in the presence of, of a great teacher. Now, Byron, I want to understand when you talk about a 10 year spiral of rage and depression and, and all these things that happened you know, a while back for you, uh, what got you to that state? I was believing my thoughts. That's the first version. And, and it, the self-loathing, the anger, it was all um, an effect of the things I would say and do. It's so guilt really is the culprit here. And when that is running, I'll say, as that was running in my head, I had no way out. So it really was a downward spiral. And um, so, you know, the, the thoughts like, I'm not good enough, there's something wrong with me, which was true, it was my thinking. But there, but my, my thoughts were aimed out at other people. It was their fault. And then when I would say or do something, I would experience the guilt. So I had this vicious circle going of judgment, guilt, judgment, guilt. And um, it was debilitating. Agoraphobia, um, what, I, you know, I experienced that. I couldn't even, you know, most of the time unable to leave my bedroom toward the end of that. It was very painful. And I just, you know, Dave, what I do with my life is I don't, I don't, whatever I can to make sure that not one person has to suffer at that level or really any level. Um, it's um, because there is a way out. If there were no way out, you know, I get it. But for a lot of us, there is no way out. We just don't understand how the mind works. And then in that moment, as I, lay sleeping on the floor just fast asleep and and I opened my eyes and I saw how the mind worked and oh boy oh boy it was um it was so radical that um you know I was in the same body but but the the shift was so radical that my children and husband wondered you know who, who am who am I <laughs> and it was um the shift it, it was from a um, um, a very confused, lost human being to um, to a you know my favorite, a kinder human being. A lot of the people who've who've had the biggest change in their own lives and in the world uh, have gone through an experience where uh, they hit rock bottom, or they almost died, or some of them actually did die mm -hmm. in a hospital somewhere and, and, and came back from that. Uh, some of the people who, especially in the fields of personal development, but even just in medicine saying, you know, I, I realized I, I had to do what mattered because I was, things were just so crappy uh, in my own life, you know, hitting 300 pounds and having uh, many of, of the symptoms of, of being very old when I was in my twenties, you know, arthritis yeah, and brain yeah, fog. And, that one. and so I like, all right, enough is enough. And, and I set out to consciously fix it. But I didn't have an experience where I woke up one morning and I had that level of, of clarity. Um, I had lots of times where I, you know, an inspiration would happen or I would see why well, I missed that. Uh, but it seems like you just went to sleep and you woke up with this massive knowledge. Where did it come from? Well, I just saw how the mind worked, but it, 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 it's not as easy as it sounded. There was still this ego to deal with, this, this, um, this, this personality to deal with. So it was like they were... Two of me. There was uh, there was this this wisdom and um, understanding the cause of suffering, and I literally designed what I call a judge and neighbor worksheet. I literally would sit and identify the thoughts that were running through my head, the crazy thoughts, and I. It's like I was unaffected by them. I saw they were crazy but out of respect for the ego. I identified them, I put them on paper, and we began to make love seriously. The mind making love with itself. For example, if my mind would say, there is you know, something terrible is going to happen, I would write it down. And I would just sit, the mind with the mind, just sit it down, 
Is it true? Something terrible is going to happen. Can you absolutely know that it's true? Something's going to terrible is going to happen. And then to notice how I reacted, what happened when I believed the thought. And that's where people's blood pressure goes up. That's where the heart begins to, to race. That's where the, the physical stress and wear and tear in our bodies from emotion, from the emotional like that began to happen. And how do I react when I believe the thought? I see images of, of all these images of something terrible is going to happen. And, and they're false images. They're images of a false future. They are not images of now. It's fake. It's like fake, fake news. <laughs> and, and then images of the past when everything was wonderful, images of the future when it's falling apart. And so when we're, when we're experiencing those motions, those emotions were coming from that movie. That is the cause of all suffering. What, when we believe our thoughts, they're not strong without the movie. So you have this movie, the thoughts are the soundtrack we believe onto it. And then the fourth question, fourth simple question, who would I be without this? Who would I be without this past, future, just now? And and then here's the world. And that's how you get in touch with nature, your true nature. And out of that comes, you know, our choices radically shift because we're sane. And there's no mind there to argue or talk us out of what we know is right in our life. What to, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, I just, you know, it was just that simple for me. And then something terrible is going to happen. Something wonderful is going to happen. Well, it just did. I'm present. I'm out of the dream. I'm present. Nothing more wonderful than that. I, I had an experience once uh, years ago, and I've done a lot of my personal development work with uh, neurofeedback, uh, where I have a, a computer sort of helping me know when I'm playing a voice or playing a story in my head that, that isn't accurate and all. And I was, I was doing some self inquiry and the little movie that you're describing, uh, in, in your head, uh, I, I was, I was pushing on, uh, on sort of asking for what I wanted. Like I, I we needed to move into a bigger house and I'd had some resistance and, uh, uh, just in my family from that for whatever reason. Uh, and I, I was frustrated by it, but instead of uh, admitting the frustration or at least admitting to myself how frustrated I was. Um, I was kind of watching the video in my head with electrodes and my consciousness presented an image of me pouring gas on myself and lighting myself on fire. Uh, yeah. and this was how, and so this is something I would never do. I've never been suicidal. I've never thought no. of something like that. And, no. and that was just so absurd because I had developed the ability that you're describing to sort of watch it and look at what's going on. And I started yeah. laughing and I'm like, seriously, like, like this is clearly not me. Uh, what's going on in here? And, and it was that ability, uh, at that moment to switch into an awareness of what's really going on. And I was like, okay, there's totally some irrational fear going on here. Uh, and and being able to see that for what it was as some, something that would never happen, but it was my my body working to to distract me from doing something that um, that it firmly believed was dangerous to do. Uh, not pour gas on myself, but to actually say, look, like we're moving into a bigger house already because you know, I need the space so I can do the bulletproof stuff, and because you know kids will be happier, and all the reasons I wanted to do it, but to just be insistent on something that that was a requirement for whatever reason, I don't know why. Um, there were parts of me that were uncomfortable with that. And I, I got through it, which when I read your books, that feels like one of those experiences where you talk about becoming aware of the, the video in your head. Yeah. False, false self. You know, it's, um, there's, you know, the, the, the images, it, it's, it's like, if we wonder what we had for breakfast this morning, if we look back on that, that you can see yourself at breakfast. That's, that's, that's self you at breakfast and you see yourself at dinner tonight. That's that's yourself. That's you at dinner tonight, and it shows up that vividly in 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 your mind's eye, and we don't even realize it's going on, and until we begin to wake up to the mind, and you know what's real and what's not. But you see this: you at breakfast, you at dinner, and then here I am sitting here now. So I just you know it's just clear what self am I? You know this is the answer to who am I? Not that, 
Not that, not that of the past, not that of the future. Present. Present. And it's um, everything we need to do can only be done now. And in a sane state of mind, we're really, we're really unlimited. Or I can say that um, it, I experienced that in my life. How does your work, or the work, uh, as it's called, apply to uh, you know people who are are maybe engineers, people who are are successful in their careers, and saying maybe I want a little bit more? Do you find that it it that it works for them, that it's attractive oh, for them? Absolutely. Or, or is, it, absolutely. is it too out there? Absolutely. Too out there? You know, if, if, if you're an engineer and you love what you do, then question anything that would slow you down, stop you, anything that um, would prevent you, like like you, from buying a larger house. It was nothing more than, than what you were thinking and believing. And it could come out the other way, but you're you're going to come out sane and right with yourself. You know, not to buy the house until another time. It was time and we're good with it. And, you know, we do things that we um, that we don't want to do, but there's no situation we can't make peace with because now is when we need the peace. Now is where this matters. If you were to describe what you do to someone who's never come across your work, how do you describe it in, in a couple sentences? Is there a way to do that? Clear the mind. Got it. Uh, that is the shortest description of what someone does. Uh, th- three words uh, that I've ever seen, but it, it, that's actually a very powerful description. You know, if I don't love what I think, I don't love what I see. Yeah. Because life is what we believe it to be. So I look out and what I believe onto the world, like we put all these post-its on what we see. And if we believe it, you know, if, if those aren't, you know, if those th- thoughts aren't, aren't, con- if, if they're not, I'll say it this way, a match to the heart or our true nature, I don't like what, what I'm believing. I'm not going to like what I'm seeing. So the way to love the world is to, um, for me, was to question anything unlike that emotion. And for me, love is center. I think you've landed on something powerful there. If you go through the four questions um, that are in your books in the process of clearing your mind, what clearing my mind uh, did for me is it frees up a huge amount of energy to do stuff that matters. Because if Mm -hmm. I'm putting uh, the electrons that my body makes from food and air (laughs) to work on uh, judgmental thoughts, negative thoughts, uh, playing stories that aren't true in my head, um, all the energy that went there didn't go to somewhere useful. And then I had mm-hmm. to apply even more energy to then counteract and deal with the negative thoughts that I wasted the energy on. So by building a process in every day, in my case, it's based on you know, gratitude and, and forgiveness uh, mm-hmm. and driving awareness. Uh, it's allowed me to do way more in my career and as a parent and all the different things I do. And, and that's why even for people who are, are hyper-logical um, you know, in engineering mindset or someone who uh, doesn't have a particular strong uh, spiritual direction in what they do, the work uh, that you describe in your books, it's useful simply because it removes drag on your life and, and everyone oh, has drag, right? Absolutely. Absolutely useful in, in our lives. Like, an, you know, if, if I'm an engineer, say, um, why can't I love my mind at the same time? Because when we, when, when our mind, when we're saying our decisions, again, our decisions are, they're simple, they're easy. We don't even have to think them through. They're, they're just naturally logical. The food we eat, the choices we eat, the, the you know, I, I love like, like last night I'm, I'm wearing, um, um, I fell and I'm wearing this, this heavy cast on, on my left foot and leg and and I went to bed last night as energized as I wake up and because my energy isn't going to a make-believe world it's it's present and and you know what a what a radical life when I compare it to um to the unquestioned mind there are 
a lot of spiritual traditions that talk in different words about the things you're talking about. Uh, they talk about uh, building awareness, uh, building consciousness, uh, being able to see reality. Uh, we're, I'm talking about uh, Hindu traditions, Buddhist traditions, uh, ancient uh, Christian uh, traditions. Uh, and it seems like there's many different uh, traditions that are all circling around this this ability to see what's actually in the world around you without lots of filters that you don't have control of. Uh, can you walk me through the four questions that you teach people uh, in your books to do in order to quickly get that level of clarity about a situation or just about their life? Like, what are the questions? Well, the first question is, th the first thing is to identify the thoughts that are causing the stress in your life or in your moment and to write them down and then take a thought or a judgment that you're holding on someone and then this work is meditation, so we're just going to meditate on, is it true? What I'm thinking and believing about that person, is it true? And I'm going to meditate there, and I'm going to hold an image of that situation with that person in my mind's eye. Maybe he said, um, I don't like you, so he doesn't like me. Is it true? So I'm in that situation, let's say it was something that happened yesterday, and in my mind's eye, I can see the two of us there. He said it. He said he didn't like me, but this is about my life, what I believe, and no airy-fairy ideas. I want to go to the depth. So I'm just meditating on, is it true he doesn't like me? So I'm looking at his face, his posture. I'm seeing that. Now, the answer is either yes or no. It's one syllable. So we, we just, we remain still in that and until that yes or no comes. The immediate answer is yes, he said so. But no, you'll get still in it. What else do you see in there? And again, don't, don't try to make nice in here. So the answer is yes or no. And then the second question, if it's yes, I ask myself, can I absolutely know that it's true that he doesn't like me? And I sit in that. And my answer could still be yes, it's true. He doesn't like me. But I'm going to spend some time in there until I draw that conclusion for myself until I'm shown in that image of the two of us together yesterday. And then the third question is to notice, how do I react? What happened when I believed the thought that he doesn't care about me, that he doesn't like me? And then I meditate on that and I get really still and I can see myself, I can see him there and I get in touch with my, um, did my attitude change? Did it become aggressive? Did I look hurt? And I'm not judging any of this. I'm just witnessing how I react, how I react when I believe the thought in that situation. And, oh, we learn so much about why the body responds the way it does. It is it's such a radical thing to get in touch with. And we cease, to, we cease to think that it's just happening beyond our, um, that these emotions are just happening to us. We're seeing cause and effect. When I believe it, this is how I react when I believe the thought. And how do I react when I believe the thought? I see those images of past, future. I see him where he doesn't like me, and then I see him in the future where he'll never speak to me again, or, or, you know, on, and I'm meditating in, how do I react, what happens mentally and physically when I believe the thought? Do I manipulate? Do I strike back? Do I get even? Am I silent? Am I giving him the cold treatment? I'm just witnessing a moment in time. You, we've heard the expression, know thyself. 
So then the fourth and last question is, who would I be in that situation without the thought he doesn't like me? And now I'm going to meditate there, and I'm going to see him. Now I may begin to experience some compassion. I can see at the time he was he was really upset. He was out of sorts. I see enough to know that I wasn't the cause of that in that particular situation. I see, I see, I see, and compassion. And, and what pours in there is, oh, it's, you know, it, it sounds odd, but it's just our kindest nature shows up. And we get in touch with that at the same time as well. And then I invite people to turn it around, you know, uh, to just flip it over and to try it on like a, a new pair of shoes. Just try it on. Does it fit? He doesn't care about me. Turned around. I don't care about him. Okay, so where was it in that situation I wasn't caring? Where was it I attacked him? You know, I'm just going to witness. I, I don't even need to take questions in there. I'm shown. I'm meditating on that moment in time with that human being. And, and then we see how it fits. I don't care about him. Now, this is, you know, that word you used earlier, Dave, forgiveness. This is where it starts happening automatically through this process. You can just fall, uh, fall on your knees to a person like that that pushes you to um, to know yourself, to become a kinder human being. Now, another another way of turning it around. You never know how many will be there. Maybe just one. But he doesn't he doesn't like me. Turn around. I don't like me. Okay. Now I'm going to meditate in. What is it about that situation? How did I treat him? What did I say or do? How did I react? That I don't like me for. I don't. I don't. I don't like me when I hurt another human being, when I say something or do something that it is, is against my heart. It's just simply not wise. It's not airy-fairy. It's just not wise in life. Aggressiveness in my world holds me back. And, and uh, it shows up here in this, this, this process. So he doesn't, he doesn't like me. He likes me. There's another opposite. Okay, now it takes a lot of stillness to um, go back and listen to his words. Look at him, you know, what do I see? And I'm trying to don like a pair of shoes. Maybe it fits, maybe it doesn't. But basically, Dave, it's, that's the simple process. And anyone that wants to heal their life, you know, every, if I have anything of value, it's always free. No charge on the work.com. I appreciate that. Uh, when you have really precious knowledge like that and you, you choose not to share it uh, as widely as you can, it feels like you're, you're out of integrity. At least I, I feel that way. I like to put uh, the, most, the most important things I know out there. Yes. And in, in this case, uh, I look at this. I, I come from Silicon Valley. I'm a former computer hacker. And for the, uh, there's a, a portion of, of the audience of Bulletproof Radio who is totally spiritually tuned in, we're all meditating, we're doing all these things. And I've seen a shift in the last 10 years where um, some of the very best uh, computer programmers, developers, uh, tech CEOs, whatever they are, they've started meditating because they felt the performance improvements. Yeah, they're hacking their brain. And they are hacking their brain. And what you've described there um, in those four questions, uh, when I run it through my own filters, it, it's a logic problem. And you can take any situation and you could make a little truth table and you can look at, at all possible solution sets to that thing. And mm -hmm. the line of inquiry that your four questions in the work uh, invite is to say, all right, let's evaluate both sides of the, the equation or the, the problem we're working to solve. Uh, and let's look at all possible angles from it, which is what thinking human beings do anyway. But you're providing mm -hmm. a framework uh, for doing that, uh, which makes it much faster instead of eventually realizing there's some sort of murky answer in all of this by just putting putting it in a Q&A format and then putting it in, you always look at both sides of each thing, you end up with a very mm -hmm. different solution to the problem. 
mm-hmm. then you would end and up you end up with a friend and they don't have to like you back yeah and it, yeah but you're, you're connected under all circumstances connected and in that we're we're excellent listeners and a connection like that oh my gosh being with with people changes our lives it always ups our game it does up your game and i I love the way uh, you think about that. that that's been exactly uh, what's happened in my life. And, and mm. you said something else, though, in, uh, in your books and in some of your interviews. You say that when you discover that all happiness is inside you, the wanting and needing are over. Mm. And what replaces the wants and needs when people do the work? You have everything you want and you have everything you need. It's just simple. Like, just consider this moment now, and I ask your listeners to do the same thing, you know, other than what you're thinking and believing, <laughs> look at what you've got, look at what you've got, and and that'll take you a while, you, you, you couldn't count it all if you just sat, got still, and looked around you, and I mean, there's, I mean, I'm sitting in a chair, these clothes I'm wearing, there are layers, I don't need them all, there's, the chair is holding me and the chair is taken care of. It has, you know, this, these cushions and this color. And, and, and then what's holding the chair is the ground, but that's not enough. There are, there's a, a, this nice rug underneath, you know, and, and what holds the ground and what holds that and what holds that. You can't count it all. You can sit out in a, a, a lawn with, with grass on it and just look at one blade of grass and, and, and all the secrets of the universe are there. And it's for you. You begin to experience it so close that it is for you. Everything for you. Oh, my gosh. I just, you know, obviously I fall easily into rapture. I am so grateful for the way things are. Now, if someone stands in front of me and says, I'm going to kill you, why is it I don't have a problem? I'm not dead yet. Now, if I imagine what he's going to do, I have lost my life. I'm in a future that is terrifying, and I am missing this given moment in time. My life is here. I'm, I've joined it. Now, let's say he shot me. Okay, am I, am I going to scream and yell before I even see if it hurts? I don't know. Don't know. So, you know, I'm, I'm saying this, it may sound a little radical to some of your listeners, but, but, um, but I am about the end of suffering and to the beginning of let's do what we can do where we are and change things. It's, um, this is a powerful, it's a powerful life we're given. But if I'm in past future, these people say, be here now. Well, why? Well, because this is where you are. This is where it works. You've cultivated a sense of gratitude for wherever you are, uh, even if there might be better places you'd like to be. Well, I've just simply noticed, and there's nowhere I'd rather be. That would be crazy. Where, where, where would I be? Where, where could I be that I wouldn't take this thinker with but me? Wouldn't you want to be somewhere not with a guy with a gun about to shoot you? Well, you know, I can run, but I don't think I'll outrun a bullet. But if I can, if I can outrun that bullet, I'm going to run. I'm not crazy. Peace doesn't mean crazy. Uh, exactly. So you could be in a state of peace, even if you're in, in a running. situation like that. <laughs> Peaceful yeah. running. I like that. Yeah. And, you know, a, a, a man did put a gun, um, pull a gun on me one night. I, I think it was about 2 a.m., but it was the most beautiful evening and the clouds in the sky and I could smell the river that was running not far away. And it was it was a glorious evening. And a man, I guess um, I frightened him. I was on his property or something. I was just out walking as, as I um, tend to do and um, smelling the air and um, I guess I frightened him because he came up what are you doing here and and I'm sure his language wasn't that polite and he put a gun in my stomach and he said I'm going to and then he used a word kill you and I looked at him oh you know I don't know why I tell these stories other than I do, 
but I, it, it must be important. He looked into my eyes. I looked into his eyes. I saw terror. I saw terror. And at the same time, I could see the moon and the sky and the clouds and, and how the light from the moon hit the clouds and the sky. It was amazing. Now, the other way is to imagine the bullet hitting me before he pulled the trigger, to imagine the pain, to imagine me not having my, not ever seeing my children again, to imagining me, all, all of this on such a beautiful night. Now, that to me is crazy. And I wasn't in a position to run. But I was in a position to look into his eyes and experience compassion. And he put the gun down. Why do you think he did that? What I can tell you is I was completely connected. And I think in that there's a, a, a kind of meeting where there was no room for his fear as well. So he just felt that it, what he sensed from you was, was not the response to his terror that he was expecting. And- and just decided. You know, I I think so, Dave. That that in the absence of fear, what is there to fear? Um, and no one pulls a gun if they're not fearful. Uh, that is uh, that is very true. Uh, I uh, uh, that that's a powerful story. And the idea that you could stay present even in a situation like that is is a testament to the growth that you've done. Well, and and also again, you know, who wants to miss the rest of their life? That could be it. What advice would you have for the guy who pulled the gun on you, if you could talk to him now? You know, I had a thought when he said he was going to kill me. My thought was, I hope he doesn't do that to him. Yeah, because that, that does come at a great personal cost. Uh, when Yes, it does. When they don't show you and the I movies. Wouldn't wish that, I wouldn't wish that on anyone. He was about to hurt himself. Do you think that most people listening to the show can reach that level of inner peace? You know, I um, I have um, a lot of people across the globe that are saying their lives are shifting so dramatically they're unrecognizable, but I don't call it the work for nothing. You know, it, it, it does take stillness, it takes silence, and it takes being courageous enough to uh, look at the thoughts in your head without trying to change them and accept them the way they are. You know, I... I, I I spoke earlier to loving the ego. You can't fight the ego. It doesn't rest. But you can love the ego. You can identify it, question it with the other part of the mind and allow it to speak, meaning to show you. Like he doesn't care about me. Is it true? If I get still, you know, the ego the ego's gonna offer it all up. And until finally, you know, the this last book I um, I wrote was um, a mind at home with itself, and that's what we're talking about. When the ego the, the ego is like a lost child, and as long as it's lost, that's frightening. It's it's a frightened identity. So once it finds a home in itself, that's all it's looking for. So I've given I've given the mind a home, so it's um, it's happy there. How do you define the ego? You know, an, an, a false false identity. You know, he doesn't like me. There's something wrong with me or I think or an I should, I need, I, I am Byron Katie sitting here with my friend Dave and I, I, I. So what happens in, in inquiry is identification falls away. And I just remain not, you know, just like not before and after. But here I am with my friend Dave having this discussion. And I hope it um, serves people. And um, I'm present. Where do you think the ego comes from? Why is it there? Well, you know, it's really not. (laughs) What does that mean? Well, like you just ask a question and um, you'd have to go back to the past to to leave the impression with yourself that you even said it. 
So, you know, there's before and after and now. And now, that now that I spoke of is gone. So, so the ego doesn't live in the present is, is what I'm getting out of that. No. No, ego is it's a, a will of the west. Why is the ego there? Well, you know, it's 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 um you know I just spoke to it's not really but but um the ego is um is it's got to be identified because ego is mind and mind is nothing. You can't take it out. You can't touch it. You can't feel it. It's nothing. It's not even air. So. So it's looking for a home. So its first its first identification, let's say, is I. Well, that's not much of a home. I am. Well, now it's kind of getting settled in. I am a woman. Well, now it's kind of settling in. Or I would I would say, now I am, you know, I and now it's he, she, them, me, I. But it's all about this false I, you know, I'd like to invite people to consider on um, who would you be without your story and to just get still in that and, and to notice how quickly that story will come. But, it, you know, it's, it's um, the ego's looking for a home and um, because it can't have one, it's mind. It is not a physical, it is not an object. Mind is not object. So I am sitting here with my friend Dave, and tr you know who cares if it's true or not? I'm present. I'm at home in myself, and I'm fully aware this this uh, this body, this object, is not I. But where's the problem? One of the things that's interesting about uh, the English language is that we say, I am hungry, but in most other languages, we would say, I have hunger. Mm. Right? And the difference there is that we're, we're so clearly identified with our meat, uh, with our body. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. some of it's linguistic, some of it's, it's cultural. Um, when you say that you are, or at least I'm paraphrasing, but it sounded like you said, uh, you are not your body, right? Like, like Mind is not body. Right. So mind is not physical. So then, what is mind if it's not physical? Well, you know, I, I, we, we spoke to it earlier, but, but mind is false identification. And you know what? You, you asked me, Dave. So I'll just tell you, mind does not exist. It cannot exist unless it identifies, and that is false identification. Mind isn't body. Isn't that similar, though, to saying love doesn't exist? Well, you know, the, the, the nature of everything, you know, I, I'm, I'm speaking out of my own sure. experience. It, it, it's like I loathe myself, and, and now I don't. And what is that self? You know, I don't really care. I'm at home. To me, that's love. Love is balance. It's connection. I, I, I used to tell my children, um, uh, you know, they'd say, I want, I need, and, 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 um, and I'd say, oh, you know, sweetheart, make friends with mediocrity, you know, stay in the center, and I understand why you wouldn't, and, and uh, balance, center, it's, it's, it's the closest thing to it, you know, no name, no self, and no handicap. There's power and presence. Absolutely. Um, I, I'd like to get your your take on a, on a technique uh, that I use. Uh, I recognize that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, my, you know, my powers of self-deception are strong. I think all humans are. And so if I get to choose the story I'm going to believe about something, then I might as well choose the story that's the least amount of work and the most amount of joy and happiness. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the example, I used to have a, a very overactive middle finger when people would, uh, would cut me off in traffic. I had you know, lots of uh -huh. rippling muscles on just that one finger. And uh, 
Uh, so it was always the the story was you know they're cutting me off because you know they're more important they they don't respect me blah blah blah, uh, and in one of the personal development workshops I I just realized well okay uh, I can also say they're cutting me off in traffic because they're on the way to the hospital to see you know their mom on her deathbed right I have no idea both stories are complete BS uh, but I just choose to believe that story without any facts because neither story has facts backing it all I know is they cut in front of me and. Um, I found that by doing that, it reduces the amount of stress and friction in my life dramatically. Is there oh, absolutely. Is there value to choosing a story that may not be true just because it's more pleasurable than one that is false and unpleasurable? Well, the reason that worked to my mind is that it was just as logical. Right. And so you balanced out. I mean, one one is just as insane as the other. You don't know. Right. But you balance, you balanced. It could be just as true. And so you, you, you got that center play. Is that a, a technique that you would recommend you know, for listeners? Uh, we recognize that whatever story you have might not be true, which is part, it's built into your questions in the work, but then to intentionally select the story that is uh, uh, equally less, or is e- as equally likely to be true as the, the first story. But rather than saying, I don't have a story, just making up the story that, you know, hey, the universe is conspiring in my favor, uh, you, know, you know it's not true, but you can still you know, choose the story and say, since I'm going to choose a story that isn't true, I might as well choose, or one that I don't know to be true, I might as well choose the one that makes me feel the best, or is that still self-deception that's going to be harmful in the long run? Okay, so so here's, here's what I would say, um, say for your listeners, is try this one on. The universe is friendly, and anything that doesn't match that, then um, I would just um, open my eyes and and see where it's true, and then that that balances and and, and it's um it's, it doesn't have to be such an individual thing. We can just take one and keep it, and I'm for the end of suffering. And um, what you described. So, you know, beautiful, and the universe is friendly. You know, if um, like when I when I fell, and you know, did that thing with my my foot and my knees um, about a week and a half ago, it's um, you know, it's it's um, my gosh, it's a friendly universe. I knew that falling. I knew that when I hit the ground. I knew that as they were putting the cast on. I knew that as I know that as I sit here, and so it shows up for me all the time. So, so maintaining that mindset is uh, is a part of what brings you happiness and presence all the time. And and you know, um, one of the great I think it was um, maybe Einstein. Um, I I I don't I don't know anyone could look it up. But um, he said the the universe is friendly, just that, and and so I would say the universe is friendly, and I invite everyone to test it. I feel like I don't, I can't prove right now with what I know that the universe is friendly. So I'm going to assume that it is and tell myself that story because life is a lot easier and better with that mindset than without it. Um, while at the same time holding the knowledge that I don't have proof that it that that's the case, some would argue though that that is an unhealthy uh, uh, self deception or you know, an unhealthy state of mind um, versus being completely neutral. I just find it doesn't work very well to be completely neutral. I'll, I'll choose I'll, I'll choose the story that 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 motivates me the most that that encourages me to to give back more and to have more energy. Uh, but I also recognize. It. Well, see, that's very wise. Okay, so so you're in alignment with that because I I do. Oh, completely. I do question that. Uh, you know, it, it, am I am I deceiving myself in the in the right direction, even though it's not provable? And I, I'm sort of thinking, I don't care if it's provable. I like it better this way. Absolutely, right. it's you know, optimists have more fun. Uh, that's true. They also live longer. Uh, there, there was a recent <laughs> optimists live recent longer. study around skeptics versus optimists, and skeptics die. Uh, uh, they tend to have cognitive dysfunction earlier and die earlier than people who are optimists. So, you know the reason the reason it feels good is it's closer to um, what I have come to um, understand. Uh, the universe is friendly. 
it's just a step closer each time. And, and so your belief is that the universe is actually friendly. Oh, actually. Actually. Completely. And so I, I like to believe that. I, I haven't proven it yet, uh, but I'll continue uh, to to believe that story because it's just uh, it's just uh, a lot easier to do good work <laughs> that way. <laughs> I'm still, I am still a skeptic. Believe me, I am a skeptic. And that's why inquiry is such a part of my life. And it always comes out, you know, on, when I question the silly head of mine. Yeah, the universe is friendly. Yep, got it. How did you keep your ego in check as you went from uh, someone who was depressed and agoraphobic to uh, someone whose work is is seen by millions of people and you know, leading voice in personal development? Uh, how did you avoid the spiritual ego side? Hey, everybody, look at me. I'm, I'm so good. Other leaders have, have fallen off the path. I've interviewed some of them. Uh, at, how, why did you not fall off the path? What What was different about your approach? You know, if I had the thought, oh, I am so enlightened, I would have to question that. <laughs> I can't think of, I would, I cannot think of the thought that wouldn't end in a question mark. It just wouldn't serve so, me. So you would run your four questions against the, oh, look at me, I'm oh, so special, and say, oh, what if I'm not special? Oh, okay. <laughs> my, oh my goodness, yes. It, it just, it, it can't hold here. Uh, got it. So that, that's how you can stay humble and, and still do that. That uh, That's a, a very, that's actually a funny answer uh, when you think about it. You're like, I, I just use my own work to not fall into my own ego, uh, which is, uh, which is fantastic. Uh, and I, I don't know how humble, uh, how, how humble it is. I, I, um, I've never really, um, uh, considered myself as humble, but, I certainly do know what hurts and what doesn't. That, that, that's beautiful. Byron, I have one more question for you. And it's a question I've asked every guest on the show for more than 500 episodes. And uh, a question that I statistically analyzed for my next book uh, called Game Changers that comes out uh, December 4th. Oh, good. And I'm really curious to hear your answer to it. If someone came to you tomorrow based on all the things you've experienced in your life and said, I want to perform better at everything I do as a human being. What are your three most important pieces of advice? What would you say when you had to just boil it all down? Oh, my goodness. Do the work, do the work, do the work. <laughs> Another way of saying that is, is just identify any thought that would stop you from living your highest dream, your highest good, and anything that would stop you, question it. Beautiful. So that constant self inquiry, you're you're voting with all three of yours, uh, all, all three of those answers. Is do that one thing, uh, and it's the one that matters the most. So ask it again. But if someone said, "I want to perform better at everything I do as a human being," and so that includes, you know, being a uh, being in a relationships, your work, you know, you're giving back to your community, all, all the things we do as humans. Uh, the three most important pieces of advice you'd have. And, and you, you would say all three of those is that one thing, the self-inquiry. Yeah, okay. yeah. So get still, question the thought that would get in your way. And um, <laughs> have a happy life. So, so for you, it, it's all about uh, getting getting in touch with uh, the incorrect voices in your head, getting on top of them and uh, and editing or at least, at least becoming aware of what's happening there. I would question anything that would keep me from having a happy life. Byron, thank you for uh, your your stories, your questions, and, and for your work and for the work. And I, I very much appreciate uh, what you've done for the world and appreciate you being on Bulletproof Radio. Uh, listeners can find your work at thework.com, <laughs> your workshop in Ojai, October 23rd to November 1st. Uh, sounds amazing to be in, in in, pers mm -hmm. in person and in a group with other people who are doing that radical self-inquiry um, is, a, is a special yeah. opportunity. Yeah. Thank you, Dave. You know, we work, on, we work on the things we've discussed today, and we work on fear, and we work on relationships, and work, we do just really some heavy work on the physical body. We do worksheet worksheets on, on and exercises that I have for people on communication and and it, you know it just goes on and on if we've experienced as, as a human being uh, most ashamed 
uh, the castles I have there that we walk through. It's it's um it's very transformative, and yeah, I, I do invite people to that nine day event. Thank you, Byron. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, Dave. If you like today's episode, uh, you know what to do. Go out and ask yourself those four questions. Is it true? Can you absolutely know it's true? How do you react? What happens when you believe that thought? And who would you be without the thought? Give it a try. You'll find it works. And if you like that, why don't you pick up a copy of one of uh, Byron Katie's works? They are definitely worth your time to read. Very, very powerful stuff around not necessarily hacking your biology, but hacking the thoughts in your head. When you look at the definition of biohacking and changing the environment around you and inside of you so that you have control of your own biology, the thoughts you have control your biology and getting on top of those is as powerful as putting the right stuff on your plate. Thanks for listening. 